Good afternoon, everybody, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to our webinar on managing mental health in the workplace. So just to introduce ourselves, I'm Gillian Donald, a Senior Associate in Brodie's Employment and Immigration team, and I'm really delighted to be joined today by Richard Rutniger, Director of Strategy and Business Development at the Scottish Association for Mental Health, SAMH, and Emma Newlands, Brodie's Health and Wellbeing Manager. Thank you both for joining us today. So moving on to look at our agenda for this webinar, we're hoping to look at the risk to businesses. What do we mean by mental health? How can we support everyone's mental health? What Brodies are doing as an employer? When mental health can be a disability? What we need to think about with making reasonable adjustments in the workplace and how line managers can support their colleagues. So, Richard, I'm going to perhaps ask you to first of all talk about the mental health crisis and the risk to businesses. Thanks. Thanks, Gillian, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, again, delighted to be participating in the webinar and to be uh, invited to, to talk to you today. Um, never a great start to begin a talk talking about a crisis, um, but let me just colour the picture. I think the last two years, two and a half years, mental health has very much been at the fore. And as we return to normality, I think we are probably sadder and wiser, but let me just give you a bit of context here before we start talking about mental health in the workplace. Um, as we all know, the healthcare system has been under huge strain and that has both social and economic consequences. Uh, no apologies that some of these stats are, are loaded towards Scotland because that is obviously Sam H's area of focus. Uh, but a study by the Mental Health Foundation uh, earlier this year quantified the cost of mental health and poor mental health to the UK economy as being about £118 billion. Pounds. And that's equivalent to about 5% of GDP. And within Scotland, that figure was £8.8 .8 billion. Pounds. If you drill down within that, uh, about 41,000 people in Scotland were referred for psychological therapies at the end of 2021, and that figure is up by about 30%. Um, within children and young people, where the crisis was perhaps most acute, one in five children and adolescents uh, were not referred on to CAMS, the mental health services. And that actually has a consequence when you think that uh, children and young people referred by their GP to specialist services are then subsequently determined not to be um, qualified or, 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 or unwell enough to receive that support. That, that's a fairly frightening thought. And then going even deeper into the situation, um, suicide rates uh, continued uh, to be high within the UK and within Scotland in particular. And at SAMH, we believe that that is a statistic that can be addressed and reduced. Um, the Centre for Mental Health, which is a think tank based in London, did some analysis at the start of the pandemic. Uh, and basically, they assessed that the demand for mental health services outstripped supply by three to one, and that gap was widening. So when people talk about a mental health crisis, um, the socioeconomic and the demographic data points to that. It is an uncomfortable picture, but I think as we will explore over the rest of this seminar, um, there are ways to address it that are not purely predicated on the healthcare system. So just moving on a bit, um, Deloitte have done a lot of work over five years on what is the economic cost to employers. Of that figure of 118 billion, uh, unfortunately, it would appear that a good amount of that is borne by employers uh, and the loss of productivity due to poor mental health in the workplace. In their latest study that was produced and um, published this year, uh, the economic cost to employers of poor mental health was quantified across the UK at between, between 53 to 56 billion pounds. Um, just to put that in, con in context, that is about 80% of the cost of the furlough scheme that was put in place by the government over um, the course of the pandemic. The factors that lay behind that cost is absenteeism, people being off work, turnover, um, the recruitment and, and a securing of employees, and then the concept of presenteeism, which I'm sure many people on this webinar are familiar with, people who are actually at work but not productive and arguably shouldn't be. And during the working from home, 
um, that idea of presenteeism became even more prevalent when people spent extended periods in front of a screen, perhaps when they would be better off either not being there or actually taking time off their work. The Deloitte study also drilled down by sector and by geography. Uh, there are a couple of other stats there. Um, within the sector of finance, insurance, and real estate, the estimated costs of poor mental health was about £3,700 per employee. Regionally in Scotland, it was about £2,100. So if you think in terms of an ROI, in terms of expenditure on mental health and supporting your employees with mental health, if you think as the cost of between two to three thousand pounds per employee, you won't be too far off the mark. So that's enough on statistics. Um, the other side to the study was that if we look at the social capital and economic capital, i.e. the social cost and economic cost of poor mental health, um, the study goes on to say that for every one pound invested in tackling poor mental health, there is an equivalence of about five pounds or five pounds 30 in terms of return. So you spend one pound on supporting your employees, it pays back fivefold, uh, which I think is an important uh, balance to just the straight socioeconomic benefit of addressing mental health in the workplace. Yeah. Moving on. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. And thanks for that, Richard. Um, you know, also setting out on this slide, you know, we can see how a worker's mental health does impact on the workplace and how, you know, employees will feel about their job, how they interact with colleagues and customers, uh, perhaps their productivity, uh, conduct additional conflict at work, staff turnover, you've mentioned sickness absence, um, health and safety issues and potentially tribunal claims if we get it wrong. But wh when we're talking about mental health, um, you know, I suppose there are the commonly diagnosed mental health conditions that we all know of, depression, anxiety, PTSD. But what are you speaking about when we're thinking about mental health? And uh, that's a great point. The consequences of poor mental health in the workplace extend beyond just the stats. And I think a number of people, as we've been speaking about mental health over the last two years, conflate mental health with mental ill health and the fact is we all have mental health just as we all have physical health and the world health organization's definition which you can see here um, it, it embraces that point and it talks about people being able to um, uh, realize their own potential cope with the normal stresses of life and work productively and fruitfully and make a contribution to her or his community being that in their private or professional life so it does take very much a sort of whole person view and we should make this distinction that we all have mental health and we should all safeguard it. The way that we talk about it both uh, within SAMH and from a, a psychology standpoint is the mental health continuum. And we'll probably all recognize this. We will have days when we're at our best and we thrive and we're productive. We will have days when we don't feel quite at our best and it's here called the worried well, I never like that phrase, but you know, everyone has periods of low mood, periods of low energy, and that's perfectly normal. The issue is when that persists, it can lead to mild to moderate mental health problems. And if they don't become addressed, then they can uh, descend into severe mental health problems and mental illness. So um, in thinking about yourselves and your employees, think of your own state of well-being and that of your organizations along a continuum. And really what we're trying to do is to promote well-being and so that people can thrive at being their best and offer care and support for when people do become mentally unwell and mentally ill. So that slide talks in terms of a mental health continuum, which I think is a, a helpful construct when you begin to talk about mental health in the workplace. Um, just moving forward, uh, I've included this um, to start talking more positively about mental health. Uh, there is a model called the five ways to well-being or take five. There are a number of phrases for it, but these are five pillars of supporting your and your organization's mental health. And what I like about this, and we, I'll talk a little bit about each of the five, is that many of these aspects are reflected in organizations, employee assistance programs, and even in their CSR activities. So the region that many employers encourage their employees to be active have gym memberships, cycle to work schemes, or undertake charitable um, uh, activities as part of their own employment 
is because it's good for their well-being. Connecting, as we uh, spoke about and read about and felt during the pandemic, is fundamentally important. And perhaps we might talk a little bit about, more about that when we reflect on changing work practices. But human beings are essentially social animals, social entities, and the ability to connect to people is important to support your own mental health. Being active, I think we all know that um, your physical well-being and your mental well-being are, are linked, and that's both physiology uh, as well as just socially. Um, taking notice, often now referred to as mindfulness, is about not dwelling on might, what might be or what might have been, but actually um, living in the moment, I think is the phrase that many people use. It is a very helpful technique if you find yourself unable to cope in current situations, is just to take step, a step back and live in the moment. Learning, again, is another activity that um, supports mental well-being. I think we all saw in lockdown, you had everyone taking out baking, um, taking out learning instruments, learning languages. Uh, it gives that sense of fulfillment and achievement, as does giving. Um, philanthropy or altruism, again, proven to uh, improve your psychological state. So when you anchor any thoughts around improving well-being, uh, the five ways to well-being construct is, is a useful model in which to do it. Um, this is, uh, uh, call it a design framework. It's something that we've been working with on a number of employees. You may well recognize some elements of it. Uh, we're often asked, how do I embed a, a mental health strategy within my organization? Well, the top box on strategy is around culture. The design element is really about thinking through what aspects work for your organization. They may be EAP type resources. It may just be doing something different in your work practices. Um, anchor that in feedback from your employees. So I think we've all been surveyed and surveyed and surveyed over the last two and a half months to see how we're feeling. Well, the reason for that is because it informs what you do. You build and run your mental health program. You evaluate it. So have some metrics um, to tell you what's working and what isn't. Um, remediate it based on that feedback. And the other thing is communicate. When you're doing uh, uh, your, your mental health planning, don't, don't deny the benefit of actually telling people what you're doing and why you're doing it. So it was just a sort of circular framework that we were helping people as they tried to, to stand up mental health programs, particularly in disaggregated workforces. So I include it here as a, a useful prompt. And I talked about EAP employee assistance programs, the sorts of things that we are seeing and that may be familiar to many people um, are captured on this slide. Something I would highlight on it is just wellbeing days. At Sam H, uh, we have tried to um, uh, uh, walk the walk as well as talk to the talk. We, we bolstered our wellbeing days during the pandemic, recognizing the need of, of our own people. And um, aside from your holiday, uh, allowance, we have statutory wellbeing days, and we had a wellbeing budget for teams to go off and do things either individually or collectively. But the rest of the aspects there are probably quite familiar to you, so I won't dwell on them. But it goes back to that design point in your framework. What are you going to include in there that works for your organization? Um, and with that, on to the next slide, please. I think I can hand over now to Emma to talk about it from the, the Brody's perspective. Thanks, Richard. Um, just to follow on really from Richard, what Richard said is that we thought it would be useful to give um, an idea of our own story of what we've been doing at Brodie's um, and how we've set about managing and supporting our own colleagues and their well-being. Thankfully, I have seen that we have followed some of the avenues recommended by Richard at Sam H, um, which is reassuring, but you'll probably see me just scribbling down bits and pieces of, oh, there's a gap there and there's a gap there we maybe need to think about, but that was really helpful. Thanks, Richard, for, for that guidance. Um, I think to start with, um, the most common feeling when we think um, in terms of putting in a well-being strategy or looking at in a different way is I would actually say it's quite overwhelming it's a it's a huge topic it's a massive subject um, and therefore you can't presume that you know it all um, 
you know, we started on this road, it sounds very cliched, um, around wellbeing in 2019. Um, and we started by looking at completing a health needs assessment as such, um, which was about offering a wellbeing health check um, for all our colleagues, um, which we drew upon some of the anonymized data around that. And it began to sort of shape areas within the wellbeing strategy that we needed to look at. One of that, unsurprisingly enough, was mental health. Um, and there were other bits and pieces around physical health as well. So our initial strategy, when we look back at it, was very much focused on, on wellbeing uh, training and um, management training, as well as uh, sort of a league of different wellbeing initiatives as well for our colleagues. Then COVID hit. Um, and I'm going to be very honest here. It all went a wee bit peak uh, tong. It went totally out the window uh, and we really started to shift our focus on a reactive response. I think many of our businesses and probably a lot of our, uh, people watching this webinar can probably empathise with that. Um, you know, we ensured the safety and well-being quite rightly as paramount to our colleagues um, throughout the pandemic and we had to really react to, to what was going on. So we did adapt. We started by obviously moving to online um, webinars, which I must admit still I feel um, very nervous doing these, but we're getting slowly uh, into a bit of a habit of it. Um, we aimed at providing support and information around to our colleagues around specific um, mental health concerns or wellbeing concerns that we were seeing bubbling up around COVID. Um, again, isolation isolation, um, restrictions, working from home, it all seems a very bleak, a bleak thought when we look back, but it had massive implications in terms of our well-being of our, of our colleagues, as well as um, obviously business and our clients as well. So, um, as I said, we very much feel now that we are a bit back to the drawing board. We, at the moment, the last two or three weeks, I've been pretty much ripping up that wellbeing strategy that we did in 2019, and it looks quite different, actually, to what we've done now. Um, I do love a bit of 3D art, so I do lovely little, um, lovely little um, diagrams and stuff, but now we've done a circle um, in terms of what we want to do. And, and within the core of that circle is leadership and culture. Now, leadership and culture to us, is, as, as Richard alluded to there, is all about walking the walk and talking the talk. We all know that we should be doing this and we all know how it should be beneficial, but actually putting it into our daily practice, either as ourselves in terms of a manager or, or in terms of dealing with colleagues or, or clients, but also as well about how we do it for everybody and how we expect everybody to behave as well. So we have joined up to um, initiatives such as the Mindful Business Charter. Again, I'm being brutally honest with you, we're only at the start of that journey as well, but that really embeds an awful lot of the practices that can support you with that as well. So that culture of well-being is really important. We've We've looked at very much digging a lot deeper into that evidence-based practice over the last few while. So there's so much out there that can be very supportive if you're really at the beginning of this, or again, reviewing. So things like the NICE guidelines, which is the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, sounds a bit of a mouthful, but these are the guys that very much guide GPs and health professionals um, around how to implement um, treatment. But they've obviously um, gazed across and looked obviously quite rightly at workplace wellbeing, at mental health, and they've given some very good support um, ideas and guidance around that. We've also used the business um, in the community toolkits around mental health as well and mixed little bits and pieces from that as well. We've looked at um, research that is pertinent to obviously the environment that we work in which is law. So looking at things like law society research, law care, I've got a lot of research around mental health as well which is again gives you a broad aspect of where we really should be focusing on. Um, so what we are very just briefly of what we're looking at is um, we've changed it a little bit. Our line managers were focusing very much on our managers' soft skills. So that's a very big part of learning and development. Um, it includes things like conversation starters, providing support around immediate well-being concerns. Um, and we've also offered um, individual assistance as well for our colleagues around um, specialist support when required as well. Um, I think as well, the importance as well is not forgetting as us as a collective, as colleagues. So we have looked around providing excellence in terms of education. How do we get that message across? So things like a whole range of wellbeing topics, obviously mental health is involved in that, but coping strategies, you know, how we um, also uh, look at themes around impacts of health around, uh, say, menopause, which again has impacts with, with mental health too. Chronicle physical health, all these big aspects aren't just solely around mental health, but it's a lovely holistic way of looking at well-being as well. 
We've looked at our EAP services. How do we provide special support that's actually used by our colleagues? I think I've always said it's going to go on my grave, the number for LifeWorks or the other one that we, because I constantly bang on about, please use this. But it's not really, obviously, it's not sometimes used very well. So we really do need to look at that. That's one of our, our um, aspects. We also want to be able to move forward with this knowledge base that we've got. And there's so much knowledge out there. The next stage now is that doing part and um, being able to get the education in so that we have an expectation that our managers and our colleagues will know what they are discussing, what they're looking out for, what they should be talking about. And again, walking that walk. The last part of that is the being side of that. So, you know, the, the aspect, the holy grail for me will be it would just be part of our normal nature that a culture of well-being won't even be thought about. We'll be doing it on a day to day basis. So after all that, um, I'll pass over to Gillian, um, who will look at what else we should be doing as employers um, to be able to support the mental health uh, within our workplace. Thank you, Emma. And yes, it's really helpful to hear how Broodies are promoting mental health. Of course, each employer has to tailor their approach to fit their organisation. Um, and in addition to Richard and Emma's comments, I think just from a legal perspective, I'd like to add a few further thoughts here we need to be thinking about assessing the risk of work-related stress and mental health as part of a health and safety risk assessment. If you identify a risk, you need to take steps to remove it or reduce it as far as reasonably practicable. Failure, of course, to do this could bring criminal sanctions or civil damages, and it is an area that Broody's health and safety team would advise on. You can think about creating a, a mental health policy covering stress, mental health, and well-being at work. Look at identifying and tackling the work-related causes of mental ill health. So, for example, uh, ensuring you are managing claims that somebody is being bullied. Uh, look at what policies you've got to support that. Where employees are struggling to balance work and home life, make sure you've got decent policies and support for flexible working, carers leave, etc. For those of you that want to have a look at this in more detail, a resource I'll be ple I'm pleased to be able to point you to is on Brody's Workbox page. This is our HR and employment law site uh, that provides subscribers with access to lots of guidance and templates and HR issues. The workbox page on mental health is going to be free to view until the 5th of July and details on how to access this will be sent out to you after the webinar. Moving on uh, to think about some of the legal aspects in a little bit more detail. Um, in some cases, a mental illness will be a disability under the Equality Act 2010, but not everyone is affected in the same way by a mental health illness. Uh, one employee with anxiety may be disabled, whereas another one will not. So as set out in the slide, there's no requirement for there to be a diagnosed or clinically recognized condition for an employee to be classified as disabled under the Equality Act. There must be an impairment of function, the effects of which are long term, and I'm emphasising that word effect here. The cause of an illness or condition is irrelevant, it is the effect on the employee rather than the label that it has. This effect needs to be a substantial adverse effect on the ability to carry out normal day to day activities. So this could be something like using a keyboard, uh, ability to concentrate over a short period of time, carrying out normal household tasks. The effect, however, needs to be substantial. If somebody is disabled, the legal obligations on the employer are not to treat that person less favourably because of the disability, such as direct discrimination which is direct discrimination, or for reasons arising from a disability, to make reasonable adjustments, which I will come on to speak about shortly, and also to look at the duty of care to employees, both from the health and safety perspective and from the avoidance of personal injury claims. And then in the next slide, we have a common question that we're asked when looking at this is, you know, how are we meant to know an employee has mental health illness that's a disability? It's a really good question. Uh, employers' knowledge of disability is required for the employee to be successful in bringing claims on direct discrimination, discrimination arising from a disability and failure to make reasonable adjustments. But knowledge is either actual or constructive. And the question is whether you should have known that the employee was disabled. Were there clues that ought to have been a red flag? And keep in mind that you will be deemed to have had knowledge if somebody senior in the business is aware, such as a manager. We've heard from Richard, this can be particularly difficult looking at mental health illness. 
uh, of course, most employers don't tend to have medical qualifications that would assist in determining if somebody is disabled. So we often engage in discussions with HR clients on whether obtaining a medical report from occupational health is a help or a hindrance. Uh, in my experience, I've seen mixed reports, some of which are actually very helpful and others don't really give a very clear answer and can make us a bit frustrated and wonder what the point in getting the report was. Emma, I know it's not your current role, but you do have a wealth of experience in occupational health over the years. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, you see me smiling because I know exactly uh, that look of, oh God, that OH uh, report was, was useless. So I, I am totally aware of it. I think it's a really timely um, conversation to have because it's OH Awareness Week. Um, I'm not sure if that banner has been put out across everybody and everybody's changed their, their week to be able to recognise that as much as we do with the mental health, but it is our week, it's our awareness week. So it is a good opportunity to, uh, to let you know really what OH is about and how they can support um, business. As Gillian has alluded to, my background is OCH Health Nursing, so I am very biased and I get, um, you know, I do get very frustrated sometimes in terms of listening to, um, you know, feedback sometimes from, um, and I understand that feedback in terms of individuals um, coming across ineffective reports and supports um, sometimes that businesses have received. I'm just going to quickly just explain what OH is if, if, any, if anybody hasn't used OH before because it is becoming an awful lot more useful to businesses um, and to obviously HR professionals um, if they need um, obviously their clinical skills. So it is a health speciality that focuses on the health of people in the workplace they can enable and support you in being um, making informed decisions um, around the health and well-being of your employee, um, especially around individual cases. Um, and OH can provide um, that specialist opinion and uh, opinion and advice um, in on employee cases such as long-term absence, performance re that's related to health, and that may, might be mental health or physical health, uh, work-related ill health, um, or fitness capabilities. Is somebody actually fit to do the duties that we ask them to perform? Form. So this OH report that you hear, um, when you refer uh, an employee to an OH um, provider, you can either have in-house or you have an external, there's an awful lot more external OH providers now out there, um, you are normally quite rightly looking for a report which can provide you with an opinion and that advice that I've said on, on outcomes such as um, your employee being fit say, to complete their duties, uh, are there any recommended adjustments, um, as Gillian alluded to in terms of reasonable adjustments, we'll talk about that a wee bit later, um, which you might need to consider to support them in the workplace. You know, how best can you as an employee um, employer support somebody back to work? You know, are they going to require future absence? All these questions. All this information is really helpful to you as a manager or within a business. But to get that information, you need to, as yourself, consider the questions that you wish to be answered. Um, as well um, as, you know, the lots of um, the information sometimes is that the reports are substandard because they don't get the answers to those questions. Well, if you don't ask those questions in the first place, you know, it's very difficult for an OH professional to be able to read your mind and know exactly what you need. So I think that's where it become a little bit lackluster and why we do get that feedback. And um, so what I would always say is um, an OH report is only as good as the info and questions that you provide. And if you're not happy with that, um, with, you know, what you want to go back and, and question it or as well look for look for another provider or look for, for what you're needing because I don't want OH to be tainted in that way but I totally I totally understand what the history has been there with with OH. One quick final word I just wanted to pop onto this because it's, it's it's it does impact a little bit under OH but also fit notes and things like that which is maybe worth having a quick um, overview of is that from the 1st of July you may know this already but that it will no longer be a GP's legal obligation to be able to complete a fit note so sign off a fit note as such and um, this can now be provided by an occupational therapist it can be provided by a physio a pharmacist a nurse so there will be different names and titles on your fit notes that you will you will see coming in and um, it is hoped that by changing this process um, that it's not just tunneled on a GP to be able to obviously look at um, you know how we support or how we you know how long somebody needs to be off and, and these it becomes much more specialized we should hopefully to see a little bit more helpful individual guidance and um, for you as an employer and um, for you to consider time will tell we'll watch this space um, 
but hopefully um, that will that will make some difference. So I'll pass back to Gillian, um, who will take you through um, the duties around those making those reasonable adjustments. Thanks, thanks, Emma. And yeah, I agree. It's it's really important to take time in preparing the questions that are being asked for an occupational health report and basing these on the legal test if that's possible. And on a balance, I think it is much better to have the actual knowledge, isn't it? Uh, so as Emma said, I'm moving on to the next slide, which are looking at the duties to make reasonable adjustments. And the duty to make a reasonable adjustment arises for a disabled person is placed at a substantial disadvantage, disadvantaged compared with people who are not disabled because of a provision, criteria or practice applied by or on behalf of the employer. So that means that you have to be open to the idea that a policy or practice that you might have may require adjustment. It might feel like you're treating a disabled employee more favourably, but the aim is that you're levelling up or attempting to compensate for the disadvantage. Sometimes, however, you know, we have to accept that that's not going to be possible. Uh, usually the first stage is that we get this medical report and then you would discuss that with the employee and of course you want to document those discussions and what's agreed. Going to the next slide we can see the general principles for making reasonable adjustments. So the adjustment has to have the effect of correcting the disadvantage so it has to work. Adjustments are, for, you know, they can't be standardised. What might work for one employee is not going to necessarily work for another employee with a similar mental health condition. Uh, it needs to be investigated and implemented within a reasonable time, so a delay in itself could be a failure to make reasonable adjustments. There are reasons that, um, depending on specific circumstances, you may be able to use to justify refusing making adjustments, such as it's not reasonable, uh, so such as cost, uh, that the adjustment would be disruptive, or the nature of the employer's activities. Uh, for example, it might be that there's a health and safety reason, that the proposed adjustment isn't viable. And generally speaking, uh, you don't have to create a new job or bump another employee. But if you're making these decisions, I, I really would recommend that you take advice on it. Keeping in mind, the adjustments are to help with the mental health conditions might have to change over time and be kept under review. Mental health conditions don't have a stable pattern, so the adjustments will need to uh, be evolved to support the person. Then on the next slide, I've provided some examples of reasonable adjustments, um, ranging from hours of work and breaks, looking at workload allocation, working environment, policy changes, just naming a few. Some adjustments don't actually have to cost very much, and it can often be that the employer being flexible is an adjustment with the biggest payback. So the, these suggested adjustments are also set out in the workbox page, as I mentioned to you earlier, that will be free to view for a week after this webinar. But keep in mind, adjustment has to fit the person and is not something that can be standardised. Then on to the next slide to cover another frequently asked question. Do we need to think about reasonable adjustments when managing disciplinary and performance issues? Well, of course, disciplinary action is going to cause stress, but that is not the same as a disability. But if there is a mental health issue that could be contributing to performance or conduct issues, then yes, you will need to consider whether adjustments or support could improve the performance or conduct. And some examples of reasonable adjustments in this context are that the employee might need more time, they might need to make written submissions, they might need to be accompanied by a family member or a mental health advocate rather than a work colleague. Um, and you might need to think about the location of where you have the meeting away from the workplace perhaps. The purpose is, that, of course, that the adjustment is working to address the disadvantage. And if in doubt, you can ask the employee what the difference the adjustment is going to make to them. And if you do make that adjustment, it is worth identifying that to the employee. And um, finally, to say in this one, you know, delaying the process itself is not always a reasonable adjustment, although it is one that we can often see requested. These uh, last few, few slides have focused on employees who are classed as disabled under the Equality Act, but please do remember, as mentioned, employers have a duty of care to all employees, whether disabled or not, to ensure they have a safe working environment and to protect their health and safety as far as reasonably practicable. You know, that's an implied term of an employment contract, and any serious or persistent failure to comply with that obligation can result in employees resigning, claiming constructive dismissal, and separate from that, action can be taken by the health and safety executive, or indeed, breach of duty can result in personal injury claims. So, 
moving on to the last item on the agenda and Richard I'm going to come back to you uh, here we, we've touched throughout this this um, webinar on conversations and we know it can be concerning uh, having to speak to somebody who you know suffering with a mental health illness what, what advice can Sam H give us on this Thanks, Gillian. And look, we have necessarily laboured on some of the sort of practical elements and, and, and the tools and support around mental health in the workplace. One of the things that we are very commonly asked is how can you help upskill, to use that hackneyed phrase, our people to have a mental health conversation? Because invariably there is a concern that if you don't address it or if, if you do address it, in a wrong manner, it can make matters worse. And at the heart of that is, is a sort of latent or overt stigma around mental health. And one of the aspects that we're very keen to advocate is, is, is make it an open conversation, have these conversations, but do it in a structured way. So this slide um, is something we use in our, our, our training to managers about having a, a mental health conversation to, to not only de-risk it, but to, to reduce the levels of concern around having it. If you plan it and structure it properly, then it should be a productive uh, activity and, and not a risky one. Uh, and I won't go through this in detail, but uh, actually there is no magic to it. Um, if you are going to have a conversation with a colleague or a friend, um, prepare for it. Understand the basis on which you are, you are going to have it, where you're going to have it, how you're going to have it. And a key thing in your behaviors is to be open in the way that you have the conversation. You're there to listen. You're not there to solve. You're not there to judge, certainly. But it's all about um, being accessible and being open to listening to what you're being told. So have a plan. Um, ask, listen, be objective. You know, stick to what you've heard. Don't speculate or don't judge. And above all don't think that you're having this conversation with a view to solving the problem because invariably you won't just the activity of having the conversation in itself is beneficial if only to then be able to offer support either provided by uh, your employer or by uh, the wider network of the individual with which you are speaking so uh, having a mental health conversation sits as part of uh, a wider care program um, but uh, do not think that employees or people should have to go into those conversations believing that they need to solve a problem. Uh, so, so we have a plan to help uh, train managers how to have uh, mental health conversations, and we invariably use these as interactive exercises. So the next slide um, just highlights some typical questions, and we would ask, uh, if we move on to the next slide, we would ask, people who are participating in a training program to look at these various questions and phrases and in the context of having a mental health uh, conversation whether they thought they were helpful or unhelpful and just highlighting a couple as exemplars um, uh, the one that says it sounds like you're going through a tough time how can I support you obviously that points to that open um, listening empathetic style of conversation the one in the uh, bottom right, I heard you're struggling with your mental health. Did I tell you about the time that I had depression is a good example of um, uh, perhaps not listening and not being empathetic in your conversation. So uh, reflect on, on, on how you have these conversations, what uh, the purpose of it is and the environment in which you have it. And if you have the appropriate structures and training, then I think that um, really you get a long way to equipping your own workforce um, to, to be more open about mental health conversations and more constructive in the way that it's dealt with. Hopefully that's a, a useful synopsis, Gillian, but it uh, is. Thanks. Back to you. Thanks very much, Richard. And yeah, you know, I suppose from the legal perspective, if you're having these kinds of conversations, you obviously want to keep a record that you have uh, as evidence of that, just in case you need it, that you have been trying to support the employee. Um, we can move on to some questions and I'm just looking at the chat function. So we have a question here, which is, how do you think changing working patterns and hybrid working are affecting mental health in the post-COVID world. Richard, I'll perhaps come back to you with that, if that's okay. Yeah, if I wind back uh, the clock about six months, a lot of um, organisations were asked, uh, were, were kind of anchoring their, their, 
their move back into the office around mental health. And it became very apparent that mental health was a consideration, but actually uh, your working practice with an organization is an operational matter. And you should do it from the needs of the organization and reflect within that the needs of the people. And um, clearly we had a very rapid shift towards home working at the start of pandemic. We've had a more gradual shift back to hybrid or balanced working thereafter. So, so mental health, uh, in the context of changing working patterns is certainly a, a key factor, but it shouldn't be a determinant. And as I think, as I said earlier, and I think we've discussed in, 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 in our build up to this, you know, we are social people, we are social animals, we learn, we experience, we benefit from social interaction. So there are pros and cons and working out how you balance that in the needs of your organization is something that I think uh, uh, needs to be navigated on a sort of case-by-case -case basis. Emma, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with Richard. It's, you know, if you look at it, the, the working from home and hybrid working model has been, and COVID has been a gigantic change model that's happened through you know with, with again out with our control so we've we've you know there's a really good argument that it, it's it's good for us and that, that it was going to happen anyway but I think we do need to bear in mind that there are there's again guidance on how that how that works for you as an individual and how it works for you as a as a, as a business um you know you only need to look at mental health foundations uh, awareness week um in may which was around loneliness and you know we did a lot of work around um because we are experiencing that some individuals are finding it difficult to um come out of that restricted um, environment and have been particularly lonely um, and have, have lacked the coping skills and have lacked the social skills that, you know, we especially, you know, one of the examples would be, you know, we've got trainees started, we have new, uh, you know, new colleagues that have started, have never worked with us, have never worked in, a, in an office environment or home environment. It's just been, so it's, it's, there's so many different aspects to it, but and I think with that, there is got to be a little bit of honesty. This is new um, and we will have to learn from, again, review and learn from what we've done. It's not our smart working policy and practices. We very much said we will be looking at it over a, you know, over a fluid period as such. Um, it's not set in stone. Thanks. We've probably got time for one more question. Um, I'm going to take this one. Uh, mental health first aid. Would you recommend businesses have mental aid first aiders and... Um, Richard, again, Emma, perhaps I'll come back to you and then yeah. perhaps let Richard round off if that's all right. <laughs> I mean, mental health, mental health first aiders are, are a really helpful asset to have within an organisation. Um, what we would suggest is that if you do, and there's no right answer to this, sorry, I should have headlined that, that question by saying there's no right answer to this. Um, with mental health first aiders, uh, they're often not supported in that role. So how do you, people self-select to be mental health first aiders, they go on the training course and very often they are then not supported in that duty of care as they, they continue it alongside their day job. So if you are going to train up mental health first aiders, have a wider organizational perspective on how are you going to look after those people themselves who are often going to undertake that role uh, in addition to their day job, they need to be part of a wider support network and be able to, uh, to signpost people to support if it's needed. Yeah, I, I very much agree there with Richard. I think certainly if you look at the Brodie's perspective of things, we, d we don't have mental health first aiders and we've, we've actually made a decision that that probably will not be the case for that very reason. It's, it's we want a collective response to mental health. We want everybody to take ownership of that and it's a responsibility of an individual as well as hopefully the line managers and, and, and our leaders being able to, again, cliched what that what, but we should be able. Now that, that does sound very... Uh, aspiring um, and uh, again it's that being part of things but I do think that to, to throw the weight on somebody's shoulders around specific mental health uh, concerns that makes me a little bit uncomfortable it always has but I totally understand that if it's a needs must and, and you, you do feel that that there are aspects that you that's a, a, a quick thing to do but it, again read the negatives and the positives around it we haven't gone down that route um, for those reasons. I think just, just to add to that, I think the important thing is from an organizational point of view, consider what might work for you. 
and whether you do want to focus it on individuals who have a specific interest and skill set to undertake that role, or whether you do want to democratize it, as Emma said. That the important thing is that you consider what's right for your organization and put in place the skills and resources that work best for you. Thanks very much, um, Emma and Richard. So I'm conscious of time and I'm just going to have to say that that's going to bring us to the end of today's webinar. A reminder that Brody's Workbox mental health page will be free to view from today and information on this will be sent to you. Uh, other useful pages will and links will also be sent to you. Um, Emma and I would particularly like to thank Richard Rotniger for providing us with such clear information on the importance of supporting mental health in the workplace and more widely. And as we've mentioned, and um, just to say again, links to SAMH, both our email contacts and website page will also be sent to you after the webinar. Thanks very much, everybody, and have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.